Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. I'm Joanna O'Connell. I'm the CMO of Media Math. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit with these guys about the promise of digital video and whether or not it's really paying off. Are we there yet? Um, which, frankly, I think is a question that all of us are going to be asking all day in one form or another. But enough about that. Let's just have these guys first introduce themselves and talk just a little bit about kind of what you're doing, uh, what your company's doing. David? Yeah. So David Shim, I'm the founder and CEO of Placed. And what we do is we connect ad exposures to store visitation. So really understanding the outcome of things like video advertising. And we work with partners like iView as an independent third party. So we don't sell any media at all. We're a pure play measurement company. And what we do is we see about 60 billion locations, first party locations, on a monthly basis, and we tie that back to store visitation. And then we look at, was there an ad exposure before that actual conversion occurred? So did someone see an ad before they went into the store? And that's where the outcome becomes really important, because what you're seeing in the last kind of uh, year or two is really agencies and advertisers saying, what's the offline impact of my media? And they're putting out RFIs, they're putting out it in RFPs and saying, this is an important metric, because I need to justify that ad spend, I need to close that loop. So for Place, we're kind of that in, uh, independent third party solution to measure that in-store visitation. And we work with about 250 plus partners across the board to really act as that common currency. I was going to say, there's so many things that I want to ask about that. <laughs> Andrew. Uh, Andrew Feigenson from Nielsen Catalina Solutions. So um, I joined Nielsen Catalina about two months ago. Uh, before that, I ran digital over at Nielsen. You may have heard of Nielsen and Catalina. We're a joint venture. Um, what, one of the things that, that I saw in my prior life in Nielsen was that you have a situation right now with, with marketers, very much like what Andrew outlined before, where you've had a mainstay of television, which has been great, very predictable, very effective. And as audiences have started to migrate to digital properties, the marketers have to follow them. But the problem is we have this crisis of confidence right now. Right? And, and when we look at um, actually effectiveness of TV versus digital, you find that TV is typically about 50 to 80% more effective on average. And um, Okay, that's probably super controversial to the people in this room. <laughs> like, pretty controversial. So, say more. So, so and, and I think, I mean, the reasons <laughs> right? for that, the reasons for that are, are th some of it are things we know, like, like the viewability, the fraud issues, the broken supply chains. But, but part of it also is that, that I, th I think to some extent we've forgotten some of the basics, right? And this actually, you heard, we, we actually, um, our head of research, Leslie Wood, did this uh, really interesting study with David Poltrack from CBS last year, where, where, where they actually went back through all the, the, I think we have about nine years of history of, of, of sales effectiveness work we've done, mapping you know, um, uh, exposures to media to actual sales, and, and looked at the kind of the three drivers for what drove sales most. Not surprisingly, creative was number one, as everyone was talking about. Number two is reach, but, but reach in a specific way, not just of, of, of people, right, but actually of purchase occasions. So in other words, if someone's going to the market today, you don't want to get them tomorrow, right? You want to get them before they go. And, and the last is context. And I think that when, when we come back to why things do or don't work, uh, that's the one I think we're going to be doing a lot of deep dives into is context. Because in digital, there's so many varieties of, of that pie, of what, how you can target, of the kind of formats, the kind of devices that, um, that, that I don't think we fully understand right now. So. Well, I do. I love David Moore's point as well, though, about creative specifically and, and that the creative shops get most excited about the television commercials that they create. You know, how do we get them excited about what's possible here? I think he, you know, he had some good thoughts and answers on that, but... That's just, that's just a side note on things I'm excited about because we've been talking about targeting and measurement a, a lot in the last 10 years. How do we add creative back to the targeting and, targeting and measurement conversation? So anyway, Daniel. Hi. Hi. Uh, so I'm Daniel Slotweiner, uh, Director of Advertising Research at Facebook. Um, I spend a lot of time, and my team does, thinking about um, video at the moment. Um, it's something that we're obviously uh, in the midst of. Um, we're thinking a lot about um, some of the questions that I think we're going to get into today. Um, how do you measure the value of video? Um, and we're thinking a lot about what's different about the video that we provide versus other formats of video. Um, so we're spending a lot of time trying to understand the relationship between outcomes and duration, uh, how to evaluate creative, what's the relationship between certain types of objectives and other types of creative, uh, and what's the relationship between kind of the video format and other formats that we and others offer, right? How do these things work together? I think is a, a really important question 
uh, for us because it goes back to what Andrew was saying, which is uh, we find that the biggest levers for value and ROI are reach and creative. Um, and so when you make a decision about a format, you're implicitly making a decision about reach. And when you make a decision about creative, you're also making a decision about the objective that you're prioritizing. And so those are really important things that we're trying to highlight and understand better. Um, and measure better. Well, it's interesting because, you know, never was there a more particular um, example of context than Facebook, perhaps. You know, when Andrew's talking about context and that being a critical piece, you have a very specific kind of environment, so. Yeah, and context has a lot of elements to it. It's the, the environment that you're in when you're consuming the content. It's the content itself. It's the adjacency of different types of stories, which in our case is extremely individualized. Um, so these are really complicated things to understand. Um, and um, the good news is I think there's some big broad strokes that matter a lot. Creative reach, <laughs> like get those right. And then these other things are second, third, fourth, hundredth order, um, but super important. Um, so I'm supposed to ask Brad about himself and what he does, but I can't help it. What, reach, can we talk more about that? Like what do you, what, what do you mean? Just getting it in oh. front of a million people or target it in front of the right people or frequency yes. plus reach? Yes. <laughs> Great. So let's talk more about it. I and mean, Cosper classic TV Absol stuff? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think like, um, so I, one way to view the world is sort of that um, things are changing rapidly, right? You're we're going for, like overly simplistic, going from a world where reach was easy to achieve on TV uh, 30 years ago and the top rated shows got you 70% of the audience and you could do one buy and, and get a lot of reach and now that's changing. And, and um, uh, I think it's still possible to reach as many, as many people for sure, um, but you have to do it in a lot of different places. Um, and that has a, a lot of crazy implications uh, for how you kind of plan and buy media, right? And um, I think one of the things that we're thinking about a lot is sort of consciously like how as the video world evolves, um, we don't create yet another silo that makes it harder to plan efficiently across channels. So we're thinking of kind of an audience-centric um, view of the world where you know you start with the audience you start with you start with a segmentation a reasonable one what you would say to a certain type of person if you could find them you develop the communication strategy um, then that probably has some different assets and it definitely has different channels uh, and you try to do that <laughs> you try to do that as best you can and I think it's been alluded to a couple times but the industry is just not set up to do that people are not paid to do that. Um, the people that need to communicate are not communicating with each other about these things. And so it's an enormously complex thing that we as an industry need to kind of acknowledge um, and start to figure out ways to, to improve. Okay, well, I want to ask the marketers versus agencies and who's driving this in a second, but Brad, why don't you tell us a little, little bit about what, what you're up to? Good morning. Um, my, my name is Brad Danaher. I'm with Experian Marketing Services and uh, uh, run the TV business there. And uh, so we basically we do three things, if I to summarize it. Uh, data, linkage, and measurement. So uh, outcomes is very, very key to us. We provide a lot of measurement, a lot of campaigns. So uh, on data, of course, we're uh, probably well known for the marketing data that we have, uh, kind of largest uh, database on U the U.S. consumer, offline data, and uh, also have a lot of third-party relationships. Uh, some folks in this room, actually, so we, uh, um, some folks sitting up here as well. So, uh, uh, so we provide a lot of data to help target, help identify the right audience, which obviously is key to targeted advertising in today's world, whatever channel we're in. Uh, second is uh, li linkage. So we are a primarily a safe haven so that we can take different data sets you know, whether they're advertiser data sets or media data, and link them in a privacy compliant way so that neither side has to show the other what uh, their data is. And, uh, and uh, with our background as a credit bureau, we have a lot of, you know, heavy privacy and security um, policies in place, so that uh, comes naturally to us. And, um, and then measurement, obviously it's, it's key. Um, again, our background was direct mail. So, you know, the LL Bean, Victoria's Secret kind of thing when you'd, you'd send out different cat catalogs to different audiences, well, you had to measure all those. So we have that background in knowing, again, measuring outcomes. So it's, it's very um, intuitive, when, especially when addressable TV came, that fit, our, fit us perfectly. So, um, so we've taken to that and now have uh, kind of expanded to the TV ecosystem here specifically. It's, 
it's my world, and uh, so we'll, that's, uh, that's us in a nutshell. I'm gonna quiz you on that in a second. Um, but, but first, the promise of digital video. Are we there yet? I want yes, no, and why from each of you. Because I actually think you don't all agree, which is great. So, David. So I'll start, uh, no. So that's more, there's a lot of upside opportunity. I don't think we're locking in all the opportunity that's there. Uh, CPMs, a lot of the times when you're talking with a digital media buyer, they're gonna look at the CPM and say, that's really high. Maybe I should go buy and display. What you, we need to get to is the point that you can actually deliver the ROI. So there's ROI metrics like you click through, uh, there's a view conversion that you ultimately went to the site, those are great. Um, but it's missing out on the other portion of the buy, which is 90% of offline transactions happen in the, sorry, offline transactions happen in the physical world. So you need to get credit for that. And today, you're not getting credit for that. You're getting credit for the clicks that occur that they ultimately go to your customer's end site. So there's a huge upside opportunity and we found like, Location attribution happened about six years ago. It's slowly been progressing. We've seen in the last two years, agencies have really kind of pushed hard uh, to say, what's available, how do we use this? And then the most important question is, how do I optimize against it? And I think with partners like iView, we've actually seen that the results actually justify the increased spend, the higher CPMs, because it might not get the best click-through rate in all cases, but that's not the end goal. It's actually getting them into the store that they actually make a purchase. So is it like, are we there yet, sort of? I mean, I think that's probably what Andrew would say, right? Well, yeah, I, I would say sort of, but not quite, right? right. You know, to start with, I think the concept of digital video on its own is a mistake, right? Say more. Well, I mean, I mean, so I mean, given you know, as we know from my prior life, you know, I, I, one of the first things you have to look at is is where a consumer. So, so, so a, a brand will go and run a big campaign on television, and they'll hit a whole bunch of people. Then they'll run a campaign separately and digital, and most of the time, they don't look how those audiences overlap, right? So they end up with these, these, these frequencies which end up over really high, and they end up missing segments of the audience that they, that they can't get. And, and, and so to look at digital video on its own, and not in the context of television, I, I think is, is, is tough, right? So I'd say from that perspective, it's not there. How about even better, looking at it in the context of television, display, search, mobile, whether it's app or web, whether it's owned or paid, call center, you know, every other touch point that you can have with a with a consumer. I think that's where we we're really not there. <laughs> yeah, that, that's. I mean, that's right. Right. You have to look at every place, and, and this is where I, co I come back to. I'm going to come back to this concept of reach, but the right kind of reach for a second. So, so we did, um, another piece of research that we did that I think was really interesting was we looked at um, we looked at category buyers, kind of this, if you imagine a, a grid, category buyers and brand buyers, right? So within a category, you can be kind of non-buyer, light, medium, heavy, and then you could imagine with a brand, light, medium, heavy. And, uh, and we looked at how the impact of how ads affect each one of those different, different cells. And what you find is they react really differently, right? So for example, for, for, for beer, companies, right? They're always better off going after the, um, the, the, the people who are favorable towards their brand. They always respond better. Um, for, uh, for companies that are, that are in prepared foods, it's more about conquesting, right? The reason I say this is because when you look at reach from that perspective, what are the purchasing habits? Are, where are they in their purchasing cycle? And, 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 you, and then you kind of look at that, that TV versus digital. What you realize is that most of the time you're just not effective. And, and when you buy on age and gender only particularly, then you're missing the, the ability to influence. So I, 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 that's what I'm saying, it's sort of there. Like, I think we've, and I'm proud to say, I think for Nielsen, we've started to bridge with our partners, right? We've started to bridge you know, digital and TV, but, but I think we, the brands have to be much more um, active at managing that. All right, we're definitely gonna come back to that. Come on back. Uh, Daniel, are we there yet? No, I yeah. doubt we yeah. ever will be. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be a downer, but no, it's so complex, and it's, things are such uh, such early days. I mean, we are just see, I mean, we are seeing new formats spring up every day, so it's not not possible. Uh, to really to really keep up. I think we're making huge progress in places. We're making huge progress on the audience side uh, and being able to understand which audiences we're reaching where. We're getting better at uh, frequency capping across uh, across platforms. So that's actually, a, those are huge advances I don't want to gloss over. Um, but in terms of understanding, you know, how to make a good video for someone that can, is not being forced to watch a video, right? Um, in terms of understanding the value of a, a chosen view versus a forced view, like we know extremely little. 
Um, and um, so, so we need to do a ton of work on this. And, and it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem going back to the creative again, right? It's like, how do you run experiments on this stuff if you can't get the assets to try out different, uh, different things and, and test it out? So we are in this position of trying to really um, create creative just so that we can run tests not knowing what the results are going to be and then you run into lots of compounding issues because one great creative really <laughs> outperforms everything else right so when you run these tests you know you need actually like relatively equivalent creative in terms of quality which is another um, rat hole uh, that that you can compare the act so you know you're comparing kind of the the execution as opposed to the the quality of the creative so super complex we're working on this in a, in a bunch of different ways um, but I, I would have to describe it as kind of you know really early days so I, I would bet too if I can Go say ahead, like please. even when you start understanding that stuff the consumer habits change so quickly Right, exactly. that you have to figure it out again, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's part of it. I think one other part of it, which we don't talk a lot about, or we're starting to think a tremendous amount about, is that a lot of the value um, that is credited to TV, and I believe it's there, is not measured well. So if you go, Ooh, if you run two campaigns, right? Like you run two campaigns, say one is digital, one is TV, and you do a good job of measuring the ROI, and the ROI comes back equal. Right, um, I think most marketers would say, well, the TV campaign is more valuable because it delivered more brand equity, and you go, okay, great, that's that's probably true. Most people would agree, uh, but how are you measuring that brand equity, right? And then um, we have very bad ways of measuring this today. We measure short-term changes in ad recall or message association, purchase intent, things like that. We call it brand equity. We do brand tracking, which is not ad effectiveness specific. Um, and so, you know, we can't really measure this emotional engagement um, that we think video delivers more than display. Mm -hmm. So until we can measure that well, it's really hard to know how to make these trade-offs, right? And, so, um, and that's kind of a big kind of area of research for us at the moment. Okay, the reason I got so excited is because I wanted to say, hey, Brad, TV, are we there yet? Uh, we're we're not there yet. <laughs> exactly. So, all right. So, and, and and it's and it's two things. One is when digital video and all these things are integrated in every media channel. That's that's the first step. The second is making it easier. Mm. It's hard. So we we live through this now. We're doing we do cross media and again we use again data like you guys have and integrated, but it's hard. So it's uh, until that business-wise, really the infrastructure, the it's too manual. What's what's good, hard? Okay, good question. So it's 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 fairly manual. There's a lot of un, not understanding. One, the data sets are available. That uh, how, the metrics that should be used, because they're kind of many times they're start they haven't even uh, understanding the new metrics they should use, and they were working with them to define that, and that shouldn't be. They should come to us and go, hey, we, we, here's how we integrate digital video in all our media now, and here's the metrics we use. There you go. No, it's, it's a lot of building right now. We're all stumbling through the darkness. Yeah. So <laughs> until, until that becomes more seamless, then we could say it's here. Okay, so now let's turn our frown upside down and talk about some cool things that we're all seeing in the wild. I mean, every one of you had good and interesting examples when I spoke to you in preparation for this about the cool things that marketers and our agencies are thinking about or bringing to you or questions that, questions that they want to ask that are explicitly about, you know, return. You know, how do I think about this as driving return? Can you just give, I'm going to go back to Brad actually because we had a really interesting conversation about uh, some of the things that, that are happening from a measurement standpoint. Yeah, we, we did. There's a lot of new data out there that people aren't aware of. And uh, uh, I would say, obviously, uh, online data, you know, whether it's web, web behavior, uh, geolocation data is, is extremely interesting and very, very useful. We've seen amazing measurement results to prove the value. So that's, um, and you know, we also, also talk about adoption of all this. Nothing proves it better when they see the sales lift. I mean, it just seems obvious, but it's, you know, there's other metrics, and but when they see actual sales driven by it, they get on board. And so that's what, what I think for all of us is if we can really prove ROI sales lift, that's... So give an example, like give an example of a, of a test scenario that someone might run exposed versus unexposed. You know, what, how are you helping them understand what happened? You know, how are you thinking about other variables they should consider? Because that was really interesting to me. 
And this yeah. is in the addressable television world, to be clear. Uh, yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, uh, a financial company, credit card company. So, uh, we, we did one where it was uh, how many people were approved, and then how many, people, how many people applied, and how many people were approved. And obviously, they wanted to judge their media on uh, approvals. Well, we stepped in, actually, on behalf of the operators, operators, actually, and said, no, 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 it should be on applications. Did that media drive those people to it? Approval is more with that financial company as to where they got approved. So, but that's something that seems maybe basic to us in the room, seems was not clear to them and was not defined. Again, it's, it should be defined throughout all their media channels and it's, it was not. So it's like they, they had the right thought, which is I want to get to business value for my company, which is approved credit cards. But they hadn't really thought through how to create a test, a thoughtful test you know, of the media and perhaps of their own site experience to be able to do that. Right, because you, you're, you're kind of judging the media and you're judging your target as well, right? Do I, am I, um, so that's what's the, the multi-pronged thing is, is a challenge. Did it work? It did, <laughs> did work. Did they see it, lift? They did, yes, they, they did, absolutely. Good. Yeah, so it was a, um, David, how about for you? Um, yours is so interesting because you're specifically looking at getting people into a, into a store. So we, we found something recently where a uh, large client they had us analyze 15 second versus 30 second spots mm -hmm. and see what the difference was between the 15 and 30 second spot. And what we found was one impression, both had lift. Uh, five impressions, uh, both had lift. But once you got past five impressions, and this is for one advertiser, uh, the 15 second spots continue to have incremental lift for each additional impression that you added in. But for the 30 second spot, it actually flatlined. So for them, that actually gave them ammunition to go out and say, what are the spots that we're gonna go after? We're not, we're not gonna stop doing 30 second spots because it does help us tell a better story. But those 15 second spots have a high amount of value that we do want more reach. We do want more frequency on that one. So they're actually adjusting their spending. Uh, on the other side for the reach and frequency. Oh, go ahead. Lift. Lift. Defined. Oh, so lift is incremental store visits. So for people who don't know here, um, People talk about conversions. When you think about digital, it's saw an ad, went to the website, and converted. That's, that's the traditional metric that you're used to. When it comes to offline, what people are looking at is incremental traffic. Mm -hmm. So being able to say, not that I served you an ad, because if you're a Walmart and you've seen it, or sorry, if you see a Walmart ad, about 40% of the US population is going to go to Walmart in a 30-day window. So you shouldn't get credit for a 30-day conversion window to get all those people, because you're going to have 40% conversion rates. What you want. I have 40% <laughs> conversion rate. So what you want to do is look at the incrementality. So if someone saw an ad versus didn't see an ad, or you look at the frequency of ads that they saw, what's the difference, assuming that demographics, market, all these things are equalized? So it's an apples to apples comparison. So what's the incremental for traffic? Are you helping them understand how to create a test and control environment like that, or do they actually have that skill set? Uh, we're helping them. So yeah, okay. I think <laughs> it's harder to do, really, when you start to think about omnichannel. When you think about addressable TV, when you think about linear TV, those aren't things that you can hold out a cookie pull for. Mm -hmm. So it requires a little bit more effort and work to identify those exposed and unexposed groups mm -hmm. and measure that lift. So they want to do it. They know they need to do it. Um, they just need help to get that way. Well, and one of the things that you told me, too, when we were prepping was the, the vast difference, I think, in quality that you would see even from in a programmatic environment from one exchange pool to another, right? Like the incremental lift in a certain set of uh, environments was totally better than in another set of environments where they might look equal on paper. Absolutely, so when you look at the exchange inventory that comes in, a lot of our partners expose a lot of the data where they're getting the inventory from. And so we can see exchange number one, two, three, four, five. The difference between one and five from a lift perspective was a 70% drop off. So really, just, just by optimizing on your inventory source alone, you can immediately see gains. And again, for in-store visits. Absolutely. It's super cool. Um, and wait, does it pay off to then sales? Do you end up connecting it through to? Yes. They hit visit, they get in the door. So you hit visit, you get in the door, and there's different ways you can get to that sales number. So one is you can utilize surveys after the visit, you can use receipt scanning, you can use credit card data, and we've used all of the above in the past. Uh, but it is important, especially when it comes to store visits, there's people like uh, OEMs or appliance manufacturers or cell phone manufacturers where it's great that they went into the store like a Best Buy, a Verizon, or an AT&T, but they go in for a lot of different reasons. So you need to be able to close that loop yep. to say, were they in market for my product, and did they actually purchase that product? Cool. Okay, there's so much to talk about. I'm gonna jump around. Daniel, how about for you? I mean, Facebook obviously 
had some had some challenges around the metrics conversation. But there's a difference, I think, between metrics and like good, proper, thoughtful measurement strategies. So, you know, what are some interesting use cases you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think these guys have touched on it. You know, met metrics are obviously numbers that report on. I think of it as really reporting things about delivery or um, engagement with an ad or something like that. That's a lot different than knowing whether that has value, and in some contexts it may or some it may not. So we rely very heavily on randomized controlled trials or Lyft mm -hmm. um, to understand these things. And so we've built a um, super robust experimental platform for Facebook. Where we're running. Um, and we allow people to do this on a self-serve basis, run their own experiments all the time. Um, and, and I think what's really important um, when you kind of go up a level to the industry is how we figure out how to do this well across, across platforms and across um, publishers. Because um, as we know better than anyone else, it's, like, it's not really that useful to most marketers to understand uh, mechanisms within our platform alone. They want to use it to make comparisons across and trade-offs across. So can I just out, say amen to that? Sure. <laughs> Everyone can. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mean, uh, so uh, you know, our um, uh, we have kind of a huge investment and in, and in strategy to help the industry kind of get to this place where we can. One way to think about it is have persistent holdouts across channels, right? So that you can do this type of work. Um, and a lot of progress is being made, but again. This is not a. This is not something that one one publisher or one advertiser is going to solve for. And so, um, how we raise kind of awareness of this as like something that's going to lead to unlocking the power of video, for instance, or other opportunities, um, I think is really important. And how we get people to kind of um, invest in an in infrastructure that is going to take the industry to the next level, the way they did for TV, you know, 60, 70 years ago. Um, that's a really important thing. Who's driving this? Are you seeing agencies really lean into pushing for better, more intelligent, proper measurement, thinking about outcomes? Are you seeing it come from the marketers themselves? I, I'll jump on that. I, I actually, you know, I think like a bunch of years ago, there was a lot of, lot of question about, you know, where, where agencies were going to fit in this. It's just not fact, more what I'm observing. So I think there's a lot more alignment right now. So we certainly see a lot of brands pushing for pretty, pretty sophisticated measurement down to the sales level. And, and we're finding now the agencies are partnering with them pretty closely and not just understanding the sales impact, but then figuring out how to tweak their targets and go back and do a better job of getting out to market. Okay, but who's driving it? The brands? Is that, what, is that the conclusion I, I, I come to I, I, I in partnership say, with agency? I would say it's a mix at this it's point. I, I, yeah, we're, we're seeing great. it all around. I think it's. A, I I feel like it's a much healthier dialogue around this than we've seen totally. for a long time. That's really good. So it's, yeah, I mean, please. It's in everyone's interest. So hopefully, uh, we see lots of people um, discussing these, bringing the issues up, and starting to work on them, which is great. All parties, advertisers, publishers, agencies, um, and that's the way it's going to have to be. Um, so it's good that it's starting. Research companies. <laughs> Sorry, got that. my bad. Um, what about for you, David? Do you think the, the brands are the ones leading this? Are you seeing agencies really embracing this? I mean, we had some, there are some brilliant agency folks that want these changes to happen, but is that systemic? So uh, going back like six years ago, like it was really the publishers. So the publishers wanted to show that their inventory was worth more than just a click. And Ivy was an early partner of ours to actually measure the effectiveness of that advertising and driving someone in store. I will say in the last kind of 18 months, it's been agencies. We've seen a lot of RFIs go out in the market where they're asking about location, attribution, how to close the loop. And then I would say even in the last six months, we're seeing clients direct coming to us now and saying, how do I use this data? Not just from an advertising perspective, that's key, but also just from a business perspective, from a financial modeling perspective. Hey, we saw a drop off in our foot traffic of 5% year over year. Can you tell us where this person is going because they should have been coming to our stores? So really, we're seeing that more and more come in. I would expect longer term that it's going to be the advertisers that drive it because they have the bigger picture of advertising is key, but that's one of many things that they want to be able to look right. at. Which actually reminds so I was just going to say, the real front, next frontier, I think, is life cycle management, right? Like, how do you think about creating desire in someone's heart to even get them to be interested in you, right? That's is that like another funnel? I'm just yeah. Well, that's the thing. I refuse to say funnel because I think that's <laughs> silly, right? But like, how am I ever going to know about something if I'm not exposed to the, the concept or the idea of the product through to 
purchase through to loyalty, right? And so we're doing, I think, a great job talking about uh, the, the sort of bottom of the purchase funnel and, and connecting what has traditionally been a sort of a brand medium to the bottom of the purchase funnel, sorry to use funnel, which is great progress, but then how does it become a true understanding of that full experience that a consumer has? Brad, you were gonna say something, I think I cut yeah, you no, off. I, I would uh, vote uh, that the agencies have, uh, doing most work, have the, the solid one, they're very much in, agree, uh, in alignment more than ever. I would say though, when the most uh, precise slash advanced metrics have generally come from the advertiser. The brands kind of like go to the next level, they're really, get analytical, we've seen that from the brands. So. Are, you say, are you seeing any, so back to the purchase life cycle thing for a second, are you seeing brands say, hey, I wanna understand you know, a segment's journey or a consumer's journey from the first moment I touch them with sight, sound, and motion through to the moment when they become, become a customer and I wanna keep going? Are they even organized to be able to do that yet? And any of you, really? Uh, uh, the question is always asked, um, okay. right? And um, the, uh, so I run the consumer research um, team as well at, at Facebook, and so we are doing lots of work on on um, kind of path to purchase, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, but it's it's super specific to the vertical, right? I mean, auto is a lot different than CPG, right? Sure. So, um, so, so what we're trying to do is figure out how we can um, use our view of the world to kind of help marketers understand better their consumers, their uh, their specific situation, but um, uh, I'm not optimistic that there's sort of like a one theory of advertising that would apply to all of this and um, bring it all together. And I think that's kind of the question you're asking. <laughs> it's like, where does awareness fit in and where does conversion fit in and how do you do it all along the way? I think um, what we're finding is there's um, kind of the most forward thinking advertisers and some of them are disruptors. Uh, that don't have legacy um, organizations or silos are um, in a slightly better position um, to try out new things. And some are saying, look, like, doesn't matter where a particular consumer is. I know there's some people in market, some people are not. Here's my message. That's fine. Or some people do want to track an individual across a journey. That's a whole different, um, a whole different prospect and requires a different organization, a different um, set of data and infrastructure. So I think people are going to fall into these different buckets uh, depending on what's practical and, and valuable for them. So all we can do is kind of help surface the data, kind of help them test the hypotheses and figure it out, um, which is a really super unsatisfying answer to a CMO. Which yes. I, I understand that. P.S. Uh, I'm also a CMO. I'm <laughs> very unsatisfied with that answer. I, I, would, I know, but you know, we are in a world where testing and learning is really going to be the only way forward, I think. Yeah. And so making sure that people, that you're clear about your hypotheses, you have a decent test to answer that, and then you implement and you act on the what you learn is, um, I mean, it sounds super simple, but no, it's very, not, it's not very so few easy. organizations are, are doing it. A Andy's giving me the circle of death. So do you have a 30 second? 30 second. I would just say one last thing to wrap up. I think your question, there's actually two different groups in an advertiser and agency, right? One is the analytics and insights folks who, who, who I, and, and the other one are the people looking at media. And I think the biggest trend we're seeing now is that we're seeing the common data sets being used across both of those, right? So I think that when you ask the question, I would say there's a it's bit a, of a it's a thing. It's a prerequisite to do what I'm talking about, totally. All right, well guys, thank you so much. Really appreciate it.